What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast. This is the Big 12 betting preview. I'm Stucky and back as my co-host and ready to roll is the one and only Colin Wilson. Colin, we're back. We had some we had some fun with Mike and Mike. Do such a great job for us on the uh, group of five previews. And you and I will have a, an episode where we kind of recap everything and get into those our thoughts on those ourselves, and we can have a little banter about some of the teams. But uh, it's nice to be back. And if you haven't listened to the group of five, make sure you go do that. Mac Maxion just came out today. Uh, some good stuff in that episode, as always. And uh, we're right into our power five. I mean, we got Big Twelve today. Tomorrow, ACC, then Big Ten, then SEC, then the last, but, and certainly least, as our producer would say, the Pac-12. And then, like, week zero is going to be here. What's going on, Colin? Over, under on the Pac-12 podcast being about 12 minutes long. We'll figure it out. Now, the Group of Five podcast, if you guys haven't listened to them, go back. I mean, it, just the way things are set up in the Power Five these days, stuck. it seems impossible for a 30-to-1, 40-to-1 to actually cash in, but... You know, in the MAC, Central Michigan was like 300 to one after they took their first loss in the like first game of the MAC season and they came back to win the whole thing. And I know from the podcast that I cut with Mike and Mike, a couple long shots out there that I think people should be grabbing. So definitely go back and listen to those G5s because that's where you can hit those long shots. I think something like the Big 12, a little bit tougher to hit a long shot future in this conference. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, however, it's not like the SEC or the Big 10 where, Ohio State and Alabama are significant favorites and they're significantly head and shoulders above the third best team in the country this year. The Big 12, uh, you can make an argument for a few teams and we'll get into it. There's a lot of change. Like if you go through each of the Power Five conferences, just to highlight this, ready? There are three new head coaches, five new offensive coordinators of the 10 teams, four new defensive coordinators. So almost half of the coordinators are new. Three quarterback battles, uh, Texas Tech, TCU, have new everything. So they have new coordinator, new head coach, and a quarterback battle. There's a chance that nine of the ten teams in the Big 12 will have a different game one starter at quarterback than they did game one last year. The one exception being Spencer Sanders at Oklahoma State, which is a nice transition into our guest for the Big 12 pod. We will have uh, various guests, not all from action for our Power 5 podcast, but for this one, we had to bring in Oklahoma State alumni and our own college football insider, Mr. Brett McMurphy. What's going on, Brett? Hey, guys. Good to talk to you again. It's uh, It's been a while, but excited to get the season going. Yeah, let's uh, – I know you guys did the media days, um, Big 12 included. My highlight, I, we just talked – I just talked about this before the show, was when – Pete Kwiatkowski, the Texas defensive coordinator, was asked about the pass rush last year, and he said, what pass rush? I kind of like that self upgrade in here. But do you want to give a, a few highlights or something that kind of kind of caught your eye or that you wanted to mention from the Big 12 media days, Brett? Uh, Venables, obviously. Brent Venables had the probably the quote of the, quote of the preseason, <laughs> drinking from a fire hose. Although Clark Lee of Vanderbilt, when he said Vanderbilt's going to be the best program in the country one day, uh, I think he's – He's uh, closing fast on the outside. Um, you know, it's, it was a lot of uncertainty. You know, not, not a lot of people know what the future of the Big 12 is going to be. You know, what teams are going to be in it. Are they going to add new teams? Are they going to be poached by other teams? And like you mentioned, there's a lot of coaching turnover. New commissioner. It was the first public appearance of Brett Yormark, the new Big 12 commissioner. I'm going to talk to him for a little bit. Um, but on the field stuff, you, you're dead right. It's, it's wide open. The AP poll comes out uh, next Monday. I, I already put in my ballot. I have Baylor, the highest ranked team. They're only at number 10. I have Oklahoma State, at, I think 12 and Oklahoma at 13. Those are only three big 12 teams. I have my top 25. And you could convince me to take maybe TCU over any of those guys, or you could, you could switch those three schools in any, any order you wanted. I'd have no argument with that. I think that's how mixed up and how balanced this league is, uh, which obviously, you know, could impact their chances to get to the college football playoff if they don't have that one dominant team to run the table. Yeah, so you think that there's going to be sort of a cannibalization effect here where there's not that much separate – there's no team that you think can really separate from the pack, which means that 
you're going to have every team's going to have a loss or here or there, which is going to eliminate them from playoff contention. Is that see, how you see it playing out? Yes, Doug. I don't, I don't see anybody in the league finishing with fewer than two losses. And if you've got two losses, you're not going to get to the college football playoff, at least not the 14 version. Uh, maybe somebody will surprise me. I just think, you know, again, that's how competitive this league is. Um, maybe there's a surprise out there. Maybe Colin disagrees, but I, I don't, I don't think anybody gets through league play, non-conference play. We get to the first week of December. I think whoever is in the big 12 championship game, both teams will have two losses. Yeah. Especially tough for Texas. If everything works out for Texas, but they play Alabama, right? So like, that's your wrong. margin for your margin. <laughs> yeah. Your margin for error after that game is minuscule Oklahoma, you know, the Oklahoma Texas are going to play each other. Their tough out of conference game is at Nebraska. Um, so not as tough as Texas, but yeah, you can certainly make a case that everyone's going to have a couple losses heading into the big 12 championship game. Before we get into more on the field stuff, do you have any update on Anything breaking or over the past week or just rumors you're hearing about realignment as it pertains to the Big 12? Yeah, I mean, literally while we're talking, something could happen. And by the time this thing gets posted uh, Tuesday, things may have changed. I don't think it's going to move that quickly. I think if you're a Big 12 fan, what you got to look for and what you want to root for, if you, again, if you have an interest in the Big 12, you want the Big 10 to take some more teams from the Pac-12 because once that happens, then – anywhere from two to four teams would go from the Pac-12 to the Big 12. And then I think you could see the Big 12 with 16 schools. The Big 10 would have 16 or more. The SEC would have 16. And the ACC would have 14. And those would kind of be your four power conferences. The Pac-12 would kind of be fending for itself or whatever schools are left over would have to go join the Mountain West. You And at Media Dads, I, I believe you, you talked a lot with Sonny Dykes and, and Joey McGuire, the new coaches – at um, TCU and Texas Tech, respectively. I like the coordinators they all brought in. I mean, bringing in Kitley from Western Kentucky to run the offense at Texas Tech. And then we've talked about this before with Gillespie from Tulsa, one of the, I think, most underrated defensive coordinators in the country, bringing him into TCU along with Garrett Riley as the offensive coordinator. Texas Tech also brought in Tim DeRuder as the defensive coordinator. Either one of those teams you think is more undervalued than the other or any – of those moves stick out to you more than the other or are you fans of both or not, don't like one? What do you think there? Yeah. Well, I mean, McGuire, you know, we, I talked specifically with him about Kitley. Obviously he, he kept an eye on what uh, Western Kentucky did last year with our favorite uh, Bailey Zappi. I think, you know, Texas tech kind of like the old Kingsbury day, they're going to put up a ton of points. Can they stop anybody? I think still they're going to finish in the, in the bottom half of the league TCU. I think somebody that, you know, I talked about there's a lot of balance in the Big 12. I know Colin, I think, may have a future on TCU to win the Big 12. I like TCU as a as a outside, if you get out of those top three, I like TCU. Um, I was able to talk to Sonny Dykes about, you know, Colin had mentioned to me, you know, the pace that um, TCU had last year. And I joked with with uh, Dykes, I said, you know, you, got, you guys were like 140th out of 130 teams <laughs> in pace. Last year, T TCU was anyway. You weren't at SMU. What's it going to look like this year? And he said, well, we're going to be a lot closer to, to 20 than we are to 130. So I think TCU with Dykes is going to run a lot more uh, up-tempo, quicker pace. And just talking with Sonny, he's very confident. I'm not saying that they're going to run the table, but he fe I think he feels like he's finally got a lot of these Texas athletes that you know he's coveted so long. He'd never really had them at Cal. SMU, you're maybe the sixth, seventh, eighth best option in the state. So I think he's very confident at TCU, and I would I would look at TCU if I was going to pick somebody out of those three. Um, I agree with Colin on this. I would pick TCU to maybe be a surprise and and get to the title game, maybe possibly win the Big Twelve championship. All right. So now, before we get ready, well, Colin, do you have any questions for Brett? I know you guys are well, talking all the, the time, so. Yeah, the big breaking news, I guess, overnight, uh, as we're recording this, uh, Kale Gundy uh, will be leaving Oklahoma. And I went through and looked at some of the recruits that he's brought in. It just it, it wasn't a whole handful of a lot. He usually on 24-7 sports, 
uh, you know, had a recruiting profile that ranked outside the top 60 of uh, when it came to getting, is there anything from a, I mean, he's been there so long. He's such a big part of the program. The Gundy's in general in the state of Oklahoma is, you know, do we expect any more fallout from this Kale Gundy or is there any other, anything big that we probably could take as a deliverable on the field? You know, I don't, I don't think so. I, I mean, I don't think it's, you know, automatically bet the under on OU because Gundy's not there or automatically. Oh, you, you know, no, I love the, love the over on their win totals. Um, you know, we're still three weeks, four weeks from their season opener. I think we'll have enough time to adjust. You know, certainly, you know, the way it happened late at night, Gundy put out a statement, said he read a word. He was, you know, shocked he said that. Literally, while we're taping this, Brent Venables put out a second statement, and he said that he resigned from the program because he read aloud not once but multiple times multiple times a racially charged word. So basically he's using the end bomb multiple times in a team meeting. Obviously the, the players had a major problem with this and he's no longer there, but yeah, Colin, I don't think you're automatically going to say, Oh, take, take the Oklahoma unders. Uh, it's, it'll be a distraction, but you know, it'll be, you know, old news as far as Oklahoma and something else will come down the pike and, you know, later on today or, literally tomorrow to kind of bump it from the headline. Brad, Oklahoma State, as we mentioned, you are, are, an, are an alum. Their win total is at eight and a half. Need your – you can – if you want, you can give a sentence or two or just tell me if you think they're going to go over or under. Well, obviously, Colin and I will go through every team in the Big 12 shortly. And then uh, I need an official pick from you. Who wins the Big 12? Well, uh, so obviously last year, OSU, six of their 12 wins by eight points or less. Of course, two of their losses – were by five points or less, including that Big 12 title game. Um, yeah, I'm still bitter about that. You look at this this coming season, looking at Collins' power ratings, Oklahoma State's fa- favored in eight games. So eight and a half makes sense. Five, five of those games by double digits. They're only an underdog by more than seven points projected one game, and that's Oklahoma. Colin has them about an eight, eight and a half point underdog. So I would looking at that, I'd say, man, I'd like to go over the eight and a half, but then you look at how, you know, how they won so many coin flip games last year. You guys know this better than I do. That stuff usually evens out the following year. And then also, you know, you've got a new defensive coordinator in Derek Mason. Now, now Gundy said at Big 12 Media Days that, that Mason's going to use the same terminology. He's basically going to run the same system, do everything the same, but it's a different guy. It's not Jim Knowles. How much will that impact him? Uh, you mentioned Spencer Sanders, you know, could be the only returning starter at quarterback. I think that's a bonus for Oklahoma State. Um, man, I hate to cop out. I mean, I, I mean, my my brain says take under eight and a half. My heart says go over eight and a half. I think I think we you can't bet, you know, make your pick after game two, obviously. But I think the Arizona State game, when the Sun Devils come to Stillwater in week two, will tell us a lot about if Oklahoma State is legitimate contender for the Big 12. Or not, because if they can't take care of an Arizona State team with a bunch of distractions off the field, but still one of the most talented teams in the Pac-12, then they're going to have some rough sledding in the Big 12. Well, you heard it here first. If Oklahoma State beats Arizona State, then go retroactively bet over eight and a half. <laughs> uh, that's the intel from Mr. Brad McBurphy, our own college football insider. And uh, one last thing, Brett, and thanks for joining us as always. And you will be joining us throughout the season and also on Big Bets on Campus Live Saturday mornings before each and every college football slate, which I can't wait for. But I need an official pick. Who wins the Big 12? I, I picked Baylor. I'm going I'm to stick with Baylor. I'm going with Baylor. I know there's a lot of reasons not to like Baylor, but uh, I just – I like what Dave Aranda is doing there. He's he's put in a system. Everybody's bought into it. If I had to take a – if I had to put a wager on it, I'd take TCU because there's, there's not enough value for me. With Baylor, I don't feel that strongly about it. I mean, I, Stucky, I'm just disappointed in you. We've gone this entire, entire podcast, and you didn't even bring up the breaking news on Monday. The USA Today coaches preseason poll came out, and somehow Colin Wilson is voting in that poll because Texas got one first place vote. I don't know how you missed that, but I had to bring that up since we are talking Big 12. Well, it's, well maybe it was either Colin Wilson or what, what did uh... – what did ESPN refer to you as in breaking news? The what? The they what, referred what did... to me in a lot of things. The, the problem is the coaches' votes aren't public. So you look at who votes in it, 
It was either, I don't think it was Saban. Saban has a vote. Jeff Trailer of Meet Me has a vote. They play Texas this year. Maybe he did it to, to boost Texas's profile. But if it's not, if it's not Trailer, if it's not Saban, I think Colin hacked into the system and voted for the Longhorns. Yeah. No, didn't ESPN, you broke something. And then ESPN said, like, according to Action Network, something. And it wasn't like a name of something, but it was, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, public, publication. Like, publication. The publication. Yeah, the publication. Yeah. Yeah. The publication. I'm not, I'm All right. Many. All right, Brett, thanks for joining us as always. And we'll be catching up with you many more times throughout the season. Enjoy the rest of your week, brother. All right, guys. Take it easy on Colin Stark. <laughs> if you look at the futures odds, Oklahoma is the favorite. I mean, just going based on like Fanduel right now, Oklahoma's two to one, Texas plus two fifty. You got Baylor, Oklahoma State around six to one, and then TCU, Kansas State around fourteen to one, Texas Tech fifty to one, West Virginia around twenty to one, and with Iowa State, and then Kansas at like two hundred and fifty to one or whatever. Um, so Oklahoma is the favorite. Uh, their win total is sitting at nine, and you can find like eight and a half super juiced out there. They went 11 and two last year, six and one in one possession game. So maybe they were a bit lucky, but there's a lot of new here. Brett Venables comes in as a new head coach. They hire new offensive coordinator, Jeff Levy from Ole Miss. Tempo, tempo, tempo. Like Oklahoma was fairly slow in conference play compared to what we're going to see this year with Levy and Dylan Gabriel. Um, so Gabriel comes in and he thrived under Levy in 2019 at UCF. Should put up some massive numbers here. Still have a loaded wide receiver room. Um, the question is, you know, the defensive line obviously loses a lot of NFL talent, but how much can – there's still some talent there, and how much can Venables improve the defense in one year, right? So you're going from Alex Grinch <clears throat> to Venables and Ted Roof. How much can they do, especially in the secondary, which has just been lacking for Oklahoma over the years, and they just can't create turnovers, and so – um, that's the question. Win total sitting at nine. Their toughest two games are at home against Baylor and Oklahoma State in conference. I mentioned earlier they do go to Nebraska. Nebraska team I actually like this year. Um, and uh, Oklahoma's been pretty dominant at home, 39 and three the last seven years at home. They do only have four, ro four road Big 12 games plus Texas in Dallas, which I'm sure will go a long way into determining who gets to the Big 12 championship game. Any value either way? What are your general thoughts on Oklahoma and what? Venables can do in year one specifically with the defense because I assume like most that you think the offense should be okay yeah I mean well first off the fire hose is in my mouth and I've been blowing and going is going to be a quote for the entire Venables tenure here but I, I agree with you that the offense is going to you know not miss a step with what they had with Caleb Williams and their production that they're able to have on success rate and finishing drives and getting points up on the board and this is a great marriage for Dylan Gabriel, who briefly went through the portal and hit UCLA, and then Levy gets named offensive coordinator, and then we're back in the portal and back to and into OU. Uh, they couldn't even make the graphic uh, fast enough for him at UCLA before they had to wipe it, and he was all of a sudden at OU. But it makes sense. I mean, Gabriel posted 27 TDs to seven INTs when the two were paired together. Uh, you know, Dylan Gabriel, after that, after Jeff Levy lost, there's injury concern, there's different quarterbacks, and, and you know, they're – were still a lot of turnover worthy plays uh, that, you know, after Levy departed, but there were turnover worthy plays when he was there too uh, in his freshman season. So I think Dylan Gabriel is a great quarterback. Uh, and yes, his best season was as a freshman with Levy, but at the same time, he is prone to throwing directly to a defender in the end zone. I mean, that's, you know, that's not any kind of coordinator, any kind of coach's fault. Dylan Gabriel still has these moments. Now he is, you know, electric and, you know, maybe can be a dark horse Heisman candidate. But then again, you and I know that you have to make the college football playoff. You can only have one loss. And that's going to be, I think, an uphill battle here. Uh, you know, the wide receivers, they lose Mario Williams to USC too. But the cupboard really wasn't bare. I mean, you know, I think they have a lot of five and four stars that are on the depth chart. Uh, you still know, have Mims, Weiss, and, and Stoops there. Still a, a, a really good uh, three-man wide receiver room. And then, you know, you add Eric Gray uh, running back with, uh, you know, 125 starts coming back on the offensive line. So the, the offense is still pretty loaded. Yeah, and they are. And where they didn't have it, they went and got something out of the portal. Oklahoma, 13 players gained out of the portal at rank sixth of all teams in FBS. They're going to get about 15,000 snaps added to this roster. And I think really the handicap on this team isn't the offense. It's the defense. Now, Venables has not come out and said that this roster was soft and he hasn't called Alex Grinch soft, but I think 
the mindset of what this team used to be under Lincoln Riley is definitely what the OU fans and alumni are pointing at that Riley couldn't win a college football playoff game because, you know, the team was soft, but Venables, you know, is definitely trying to install a new culture. Uh, He's going very hard on them during two days during fall camp, Uh, summer practices, summer workouts were were pretty legit uh, in the heat that we've had here in Oklahoma, but he wants this team to be absolutely tough. Uh, but I have a monster issue with this defense, which is why I don't think, I mean, maybe they can win the big 12. There's some questions at the top, but I don't think they're going to the college football playoff. And I would be not surprised if they finish the season nine and three, which will go under nine and a half. And the reason for that is that there's no linebackers here. I mean, we have some returning to the back, uh, to the, to the secondary. We have some players returning to the defensive line, but when Venables was at his best, he had James Skowski for six years as the captain of that defense at Clemson. He had Mike Jones, who's now, you know, we'll talk about him in the LSU preview. He's now at LSU. But those two linebackers, the, the defense for Clemson thrived on getting everybody lined up. And if you want to say stealing signals, you know, there's sugar huddling, stealing signals. Venables is great at that. We'll get to the ACC pod and how that translates to them. But Oklahoma does not have a linebacker that – does what Skowski and Jones did at Clemson. And that makes me a little bit worried because there's a lot of fresh faces in the linebacker core and to be in Venable's system, you have to be able to do that. So just 50% of the pressures returned from last year. Uh, defensive tackle Jalen Redmond was responsible for a lot of that. He lost, lost three defensive linemen, a linebacker and a safety to the NFL. That defense yeah. last year and another safety to the portal. Yeah, and, and so, you know, they're, they're going to be able to produce a little bit of pressure, but they lost over half their pressures. Uh, They lost half of a lot of stuff uh, from stops and PBU perspective. And, you know, there's only three games on the schedule that I project the Sooners as two touchdown favorites. I mean, generally we're talking like Ohio state and Alabama type schedule where your favorite is double digits in every game, but this year I've only got three and the Huskers is one of those games where it's a pretty short spread. I could easily see an upset there, uh, you know, pending Casey Thompson playing, you know, at at his peak. Uh, But, you know, along with Kansas state and Baylor, these are games where, the defensive trench has an advantage over Oklahoma's offensive line. So I'm sticking to my projection of 9.2. I think under nine and a half is the play, but I wouldn't exceed the juice of minus 120. Yeah. If you could get under nine and a half, I think that's where I go, but I I, I make this right right around. I make the win total right around nine. I don't see any value in them to win the big 12, any value in them to win the college football club. I think the offense will be fine. Levy and Gabriel, already have continuity also, which I think helps with the transition. The biggest question is what can, what will Venables and Roof, as I mentioned before, be able to do with the defense in year one? How much is that worth, right? They did bring some talented transfers into, and the secondary has experience, you know, guys like Woody Washington, like how much better are they going to play being coached up by this defensive staff in, you know, with some scheme changes, how much will that translate to an uptick in on-field efficiency on the defensive side of the ball i don't know um that's the big unknown so i i think nine is is a good number i have them a small underdog in nebraska i uh, and then basically you know at tcu texas and dallas those are like coin basically coin flip games so i think that if the defense if you know venables and the defense are a lot better than i project and they're probably going to go over nine and win 10 games if they're not they're probably going to win eight so i think they're a wait and see team and uh, bet them on a game by game basis. Start off with UTEP and Kent, and Kent State. So I don't know how much we'll learn about them then, but at Nebraska, we certainly will. Um, all right. But but moving should, on to by this, the way, we, yeah. we should expect a, an increase in tempo, right? I think tempo, one of the things about me going to all the media days was I was secretly asking, what is your tempo going to be on offense, right? Because that relates to totals. And Oklahoma is one of those teams where there's going to be struggles on defense and there's going to be a huge increase on tempo on offense. So be looking for OU over a single game over is when the season starts. I'm right, moving on to the second favorite in the big 12 with Texas plus 250. I don't know if you can still find three to one out there. Texas coming off a very disappointing year. They finished five and seven. Their win total is about over eight and a half minus 115. They did go two and five in one possession games were a bit unlucky. You could say, especially when in the turnover department, So there's some regression signs on the positive side for Texas. Is Texas back yet? Not sure. I think it's going to come down to the, to the defensive side of the ball, but some of the positive signs, the things you got to like about Texas. I mean, it's just, uh, to me, it's the most talented team, right? They, they're, they continue to crush recruiting. I think they did a really good job in the transfer portal. I like some of the assistant coaches that they brought on as well. 
but it's year two of, of the staff. So you can expect this Sark offense with all the receivers they got. As long as Quinn yours pans out a quarterback, and I assume that he's going to get the job, there is technically a quarterback battle, I assume, going on with Hudson Carr. But if yours pans out, this offense in year two of Sark should be exposed. The offensive line was really good last year. They bring back three starters and then, you know, led by Worthy, a wide receiver, and then Bijan Robinson is arguably the best running back in the country. Just like Oklahoma, I don't have any concerns about this Texas offense. Everything comes down to the defense. Last year, they were 99th in scoring on defense, um, 115th in rushing. They could not stop the outside zone attacks that so many Big 12 teams utilize on the offensive end. So, you know, what, what can this defense do in year two? You have a lot of talent, right? But, like, I mean, only Overshone and linebacker was the only one who had any honorable mention in anything preseason. But there's a lot of talent that's just been unproven or very young now. Can, you know, in year two in Kwiatkowski's system with Gary Patterson now on as a consultant, what can they do on the defensive side of the ball? That is the big question with Texas. So, you know, their win total of eight and a half, they do have a manageable road schedule, right? They only play four road games at Texas Tech, at Oklahoma State, at Kansas State, and at Kansas. I have the two fit, you know, favored in two of those, a coin flip in one. Actually, I'm favored in three, and then one to coin flip. So you got to love their road schedule. Um, I have them favored by seven or more in seven games with two coin flips, you know, likely lost against Alabama, and then two short favorites. So there's a path to getting to 10 wins, 11 wins, if the defense works out. And then, you know, obviously a young quarterback has to come in and step in. But you have, you know, kind of card as, as insurance as well. So it just comes down to what you think this defense is going to do. And – to me, with all of the talent here, Sark in year two, the defense can only go one way but up. And I love what they did in the portal. I mentioned I love some of the assistance they brought in. I don't want to go Texas win total over, but I did play some plus 325 to win the Big 12. Um, I don't think that they should be different than Oklahoma. For example, that game in Dow, I have that game as a true pick, right? And you can assume that one of those, the team, the team that wins that game, most likely going to go to the big 12 championship game. Um, so I played some plus three twenty five. It sounded two fifty. I don't really like it if you at two fifty, but like three to one or higher. Um, I think Oklahoma and Texas should be you kind of have the same questions on, but like with both teams. Um, and I think that I have them power rated basically equal. So I took a shot of plus three twenty five on the upside. Like I don't want to go over eight and a half because if it doesn't work out on the defensive side of the ball, um, then they're going to, lose some games and who knows maybe they lose to kansas again they go to kansas late in the year um so what are your thoughts on texas your boy sark yep um and uh what are your thoughts on the horns are, the, are uh, texas back he's texas back it was great to catch up with coach Star sarkeesian at uh, big 12 media days he uh everybody was asking him about his thoughts on alabama and conference realignment and then i was asking him flat out about how much 12 are you going to run what's your pace going to be tell me about Jalil billingsley coming through the portal because you loved him at tight end from alabama so it was good to kind of chop it up with uh coach sark at big 12 media days but i mean there was i think the thing that you're not going to get in the spreadsheet is that you're going to have to throw out last year's stats this defense wasn't talking to each other. They weren't communicating. They didn't accept P Pete Kwiatkowski's scheme. Uh, and then on the offensive side of the ball, they were kind of limited in what Sark wanted to do. Yeah, let's move the pocket out to the right and dump it to Bjorn, Bjorn Robinson out to the left in the flats and let him try to, you know, miss court, create missed tackles and, and bulldoze over everybody else. So I think you wipe away all the stats from last year, period. Uh, you know, they gained seven players from the transfer portal, so we got a new season. And this is a tough handicap because of Quinn Ewers, right? How many passes have we seen this kid throw? I keep hearing yep. we have different arm angles, and he can throw off of one foot, leaning the other way, very Patrick Mahomes type things that we're hearing about what he can do as far as spinning the ball. And then the other side of the ball is the defense, right? And the players weren't bought into Pete Kwiatkowski's uh, defensive scheme. Of course, none of those players were his. And Gary Patterson joins the staff. Now, <laughs> I don't know how we say this. Uh, my daughter calls it spilling the tea. Uh, she's a teenager. She calls it spilling the tea. So if you want to know what the tea is on Texas, Patterson was not a coach that Sarkeesian went out and got. Uh, there is sort of a, a feeling out there that Patterson was kind of forced in uh, to help with this defense, to see what, you know, and both him and Kwiatkowski run the four, two, five, 
Uh, and now they're comparing notes and they're kind of tag teaming it up, even though one's a defensive coordinator and one's an analyst. Do you think that uh, Gary Patterson is more there to get boots on the ground and get these kids communicating with each other? And if something happens with Pete Kwiatkowski and his job and gets fired midseason, Patterson was brought in for that role, too. So that, you know, leaves me with even more questions on the defense. But, you know, last season, the second half, I, I just I think that the whole roster fell apart. Communication was such a big deal that Sark has said, We've been doing team building all summer or the rest of the winter, all summer long. Players weren't talking to each other. Uh, and that really comes down to, you know, Demarion Overshone, uh, who talked about how they're, you know, spending so much time together uh, and, and they really need to do, be better at calling out coverages, adjusting to audibles. So we'll see if that defense is a, is a more polished product. And, and, you know, if the message that the coaches are giving have been received, something we can't handicap until we see them on the field. They're a, a modest 65% on both sides of the ball, uh, according to TARP. Uh, of course, you know, Xavier Worthy is there. Uh, he's the leading, you know, target here for whoever's going to be the quarterback between Hudson Card and Quinn Ewers. And then when I get back to, you know, Card and, and Ewers, my whole question is, is are we going to see Hudson Card play in the first two games of the season against ULM and Alabama, and we save Quinn Ewers until after, you know, the, the tide come to town? Or are we just going to throw him in there and say, you know, let's see what you could do. So that's going to be the big question as we, as we get up there. Uh, and you think they just let Hudson card, just get, uh, just let Will Anderson tee off on Hudson card for an entire game and then bring in yours the next week. I wouldn't be surprised. Right. Because the conference schedule is right in front of you and why not start him off against a UTSA defense that lost just about everybody too. So uh, you know, I agree with you. Over eight is the play, but it's so small. I project 8.3. There's juice built into that over eight. Uh, and I think if, you know, we've gone through Oklahoma and Texas now, and there's not a real huge betting deliverable. So let me give everybody a betting deliverable. And that is the fact that I went to Big 12 Media Days and all Sark could talk about is how much he loves Coach Saban, how, uh, how much he loves Miss Terry. They treated him like family. They boosted his career. The respect level is out the door. Will you expect that out of a former Proto, you know, someone that coached under Saban. But then I went to SEC media days and Saban was literally gushing like it was one of his own children talking about how Sark is very special. He's one of the best coordinators we've ever had on staff. The level of respect that Saban was giving to Sark, I, I didn't hear that. I don't hear him talk that way about Lane. I don't hear him talking that way about Kirby, any of his former assistants. Sark has a real special place with Saban. And so that spread that opened up at 14, it's going to start climbing. It's going to steam. And for me, I think Alabama goes in there and of course they could beat them by 50 if they wanted it. This defense is not communicating and all these problems that I talked about exist before, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think Saban is dead set on going in there and giving them the Notre Dame playoff treatment, which was give me three scores and sit on the ball. They get to 14, we'll go score a touchdown, but you know, we're going to run, we're going to milk clock. We're going to keep this. The, pro know. the problem is, though, is if Texas run D is not improved at all, is that <laughs> <laughs> like, does that mean that Alabama is I, still just going right down the field and scoring touchdowns at will running the ball? That's the I, only fear. I think this number steams to 20 and a half, though. I think you and I, Saturday morning, doing the show with Brett, and we are watching a screen that just flies this thing up to 19 and a half, 20. And so you can, and I'm not saying take that number now. I'm saying you can guarantee week two and you, when you and I are doing that live show an hour before kick. I'm looking at that Texas number. And if it's at 20, I'm going to be hitting it because they're not going to quit the entire game. Alabama is not going to be trying to rub it in on Sark whatsoever. Uh, and you, I don't expect to see Bryce Young or a whole, I mean, Alabama has injury concerns all the time. Cameron Latou, we'll get to SEC, but Cameron Latou is already banged up every year. There's a, there's a waddle. There's a, there, you know, there, there's always somebody that's hurt. So I don't expect to see Bryce Young playing in the second half. I don't expect to see a lot of the starters in the second half. So Backdoor yeah, there could be some Alabama's offense could have a little growing pains early in the year. Yeah. Um, so you could see some, you know, with their offensive line and receivers, like there's the best team in the country. But um, yeah, I think a lot of it depends on the Texas quarterback situation. Yeah. Um, so like, what's, like you said, is it going to be, I wouldn't really trust card from what I've seen. No. Do we see yours early? Do we also like anticipate is it card? And then if it's a blowout, does yours get run like that? Could, then are you better looking at Texas live? I don't know. So there's a lot to get to before we get to that. But I like Texas as a shot to win the Big 12. If you can get three to one don't or better. Um, I have I actually have them slightly ahead of Oklahoma. I know all my friends in Norman who I love um, and Boomer Sooner fans are not going to like to hear that. But I do love the hire of Venables long term. And I think it raises their ceiling because in order to get to a national title, a real national title contender, their defense needed to be fixed. And 
you would assume that Venables will get that done over time. All right, let's move on to the third and fourth. The teams with the third and fourth best um, odds to win the Big 12, and that's Baylor and Oklahoma State, both sitting at around 6-1. to one. I'll tell you, Brett gave his opinion on the win total for Oklahoma State. I'll, I'm curious to get your thoughts. My favorite win total in the Big 12 is Oklahoma State, under 8.5. Negative regression candidate right off the top. They were plus 11 in turnovers last year, which is I don't think they could duplicate that with all they lost on the defensive side of the ball. And they still have Spencer Sanders, who yeah, the guy still has, what, 40 turnovers and 32 starts. He's, and you never know when he's going to have a clunker of a game when he just gets charitable and gives the ball away for an entire game to the other team. They were 6-2 and two in one possession games last year. They had lucky wins versus, what, you could argue, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, Boise. I uh, an inverted whistle in Texas. You know, they got that pick six to change the game. Unlucky versus Baylor and Iowa State, but certainly very unfortunate overall. And a big theme that you'll see with a lot of the win totals that I like are coordinator changes that I think are either not valued enough or overvalued in the market. And I, law, I, I, I just think that the loss of Jim Knowles is massive. And he, the second, I mean, they lost so much on that defense uh, to the portal and to graduation. You lose four of you, four or five extremely productive defensive backs. You lose Malcolm Rodriguez at linebacker. Um, you also lose your top receiver and running back. The offensive line dealt with a lot of, you know, kind of shuffling around last year. So maybe they're better with more continuity, but there's still depth questions there and they're still figuring out some things. So yeah, young secondary linebacker, major question. This defense arguably was the second, third best behind Georgia. In the country last year, I think you see a massive drop. They lost six of their eight top tacklers last year, and I think the, the loss of Knowles is big. They also have to play five Big 12 road games, including Oklahoma and Baylor. So when I look at the schedule, I assume they start 3-0. I assume they beat Central Michigan, Arizona State, and Pine Bluff. And your Pine Bluff boys. Then they get a bye before they go to, before they go to Baylor. So they have five Big 12 road games at Baylor, at Oklahoma, um, at Kansas, Kansas does come off of a bye at Kansas State and at TCU. Let's let's call. I mean, to me, that looks like two and three. You know, TCU, Baylor, say, you know, Oklahoma, Kansas State, and we'll give them a win at Kansas, but maybe that's trickier later in the year if Kansas is improved and Kansas is coming off a bye. Let's call that two and three, which I think is realistic. Then they got to sweep their home games to get to nine wins. And, you know, they play Texas to, in conference, Texas Tech. Iowa State, West Virginia should be wins, but I could see them dropping one of those games. And then they also have Texas at home. Um, so I make this a little under eight. I think there's a lot of regression coming from Oklahoma State. Another thing to keep in mind with these offensive line questions, their, ba their, their backup quarterback is now the quarterback at Nevada. If something happens to Sanders, there is no experience behind him, and then it could get really ugly. Um, so I think there's more questions than answers with this Oklahoma State team. Loss of Knowles is big. Give me under eight and a half wins. Any thoughts on the pokes? I agree with you. I mean, I projected at eight, so under eight and a half, I think, is the way you got to go is you got to take the under on this. And, and, you know, I think defense is where most of the focus has been, considering, you know, Colin Oliver is still the edge there. Tyler Lacey is going to be an edge there, but they lost a lot from the Jim Knowles defense. So you switch over to Derek Mason, who was running out of Auburn to take this job. They both both Knowles and Mason run a 4-2-5 defense. They like their nickel defenses. And if you look at what Auburn posted last year under Derek Mason, top 50 in success rate, 39th in finish, defensive finishing drives, and 31st in havoc. So, you know, he kept Auburn uh, a little bit outside of what average defenses do in the SEC play. And then when you get into this season, he's got to come in and take over after Jim Knowles, who is off to greener pastures at Ohio State. So, you know, the defense returns just 19% per tarp and, and Colin Oliver was a big part of that havoc, a part of that stops and a part of the pressures. And I, I don't think, you know, Brett mentioned it. There's a lot of, there's no scheme change here. There's no verbiage being changed is what the players are using. And they're, Oklahoma State's only really proven solid at the edge positions. And then they have a safety, uh, Jason Taylor, the second. So that's it. Besides that, there's going to be a lot of crossing routes uh, that these offenses are going to attack them at, especially around the linebackers. Uh, corners are going to be a little bit of a problem here. So, you know, we could be back to some real high scoring games. That is if the offense can keep up, because you're right, if Spencer Sanders gets hurt, we don't know what Oklahoma State's going to do on offense, which I was shocked when I got to Big 12 media days. I heard Spencer Sanders preseason Big 12 quarterback. I said, how many quarterbacks are there in this league? Where's everybody gone? And Spencer Sanders is the number one quarterback in the preseason Big 12 voting. Um, you know, the Pokes didn't hit the portal hard. They acquired just five players. 
Uh, one of those offensive tackle from USC to kind of bolster the trench. Sanders does get all of his wide receivers back with the exception of Tay Martin. He was the leader. Uh, Brennan Presley kind of leads that group. Uh, and, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions about who's going to handle the rock behind the line of scrimmage. We don't really know what their rushing attack is going to be. On the schedule, I agree with you. I mean, and you're in the Big 12, you're always going to get either four home games and five roadies, or it's going to be vice versa. And this is the season that Oklahoma State's got to have five roadies. The Pokes have three games that they should win in non-conference. I say should because Central Michigan is there. You can look up the history. Uh, Oklahoma State, double-digit favorites in two conference games against Kansas and West Virginia. After that, I'm not sure coin flips against Baylor, TCU, and Kansas State. Or, you know, you can't write them in as victories. We're going to get to those teams, but the projection of Oklahoma State is eight. I think under eight and a half is the play. I can't see how they get nine on this schedule whatsoever. Uh, you know, it's not something where I think they completely fall apart because I believe Gundy, I don't have this in front of me, but I, I think he's won at least six games every single year he's been in Stillwater. So I don't think they're going to just fall off the face of the earth. But you the know, floor is high here. Like, you know, they're going to yeah. win six, yeah, the six floor is games high. at the minimum. But no, one, there's not going to be nine wins. Yeah, I, I agree with you here. Uh, the other team that I mentioned was Baylor, uh, the defending Big 12 champs here. They were they were pretty, they went 12 and two last year. Uh, Dave Aranda's doing a tremendous job. Jeff Grimes back for year two of offensive coordinator. Looks like Blake Shapin's going to be the quarterback. He closed the year out. I, I'm not as sold on him. Bohannon leaves. I wasn't sold on Bohannon either. And they have to replace a lot, like of all their skill position players. They're, that's the main question at Baylor. And then, you know, they also lost, I mean, they lost their top two running backs, their top seven receivers. And then on the defensive end, defensive side of the ball, they lost four of their top five tacklers. Uh, their win total is what, sitting at around eight. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had to bet this, I would go under, mainly because I'm not sold on the quarterback situation. I do have questions about uh, the skill positions. Five Big 12 road games that go to OU, Texas, and Iowa State. They also go to BYU. Um, and they get they go to West Virginia and West Virginia is off of a bye. They get Oklahoma State off of a bye. Um, gun to my head, I go under, but I think it's priced about right. Um, but I'm just not a fan of the quarterback situation. If that ends up working out, then they could certainly read people. What are your thoughts on the Bears? Under by far. Uh, this is one of the first totals that I hit. Uh, I project this at six. SP plus has this, I think, at 7.2, 7.4. So under eight, under seven and a half is the way that I would want to go. Uh, and if you look at it just based upon tarp, uh, passing, receiving, rushing yards, Baylor lost a lot of skill positions. They lost absolutely everybody. You go on to the other side of the ball, defensive pressure stops, PBUs, that took a major hit too. So Aranda's got to rebuild here. Uh, and, you know, like I said, Although the running backs and the wide receivers are gone, the offensive the offensive line, probably the best in the Big 12. Among those is Connor Galvin, should be an All-American. Uh, and, and, you know, Shapin, I'm not a Shapin fan. 18 dropbacks with pressure last year, just 54% adjusted completion percentage. So, you know, if the offensive line is better, that's going to keep him out of trouble. But we saw Shapin take off out of the pocket and take some licks last year, and he's he's got to learn to not do that, either get out of bounds, get down, or not take off at all. Uh, the good news for Baylor is you have the easiest rank of SP plus defenses of any other big 12 team. So that is in the good news for them, but this projection is just way too high. And it's based upon the fact of what they did last year. The defense has a lot of holes to plug. It's a Randa's defense. So it's multiple. I mean, there's like five to six different personnel that you're going to be running. So you have to learn that among the transfers or Jackson player on the interior line. Uh, Love him. Yeah. I mean, he's going to be great. And of course, Siaka Ika is going to return to the defensive line. He's, top 20 in the nation as a pass rusher, as a rush stopper individually in FBS. So I like what Baylor does in the trench. They're going to be able to punch people in the mouths on both sides of the ball, but this projection is way too high and depth quarterback and no skill positions. I'm out on an over here. I don't think they can win the conference and I'll take an under. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. By the way, is RJ Sneed, did is he from Colorado? Why did he transfer to Colorado in that horrendous <laughs> offense? Um, Batman, the NIL. Of- <laughs> yeah true speaking of uh transfer receivers i have to mention with texas isaiah Nair from wyoming who i love who can fly he transfers to, to bolster their receiving room and i love him because he had that catch at the end of the boise state game to go 70 yards to cover uh so shout out to him all right um let's yeah i agree with you on the under there um with baylor it was under nothing for me and you confirmed it let's move on to kind of the next tier teams that are sitting around 14 to one to win the conference, Kansas state and TCU. I think you made a bet 
to, on TCU to win the conference. Kansas State, the question with them is, okay, you have Adrian Martinez coming in for Skylar Thompson. You have Deuce Vaughn in the backfield. And now Klein, Colin Klein, the new offensive coordinator. I think you're going to see a, a more up-tempo offense at Kansas State than we're used to seeing. Um, do have some questions at the back, back end of their defense. But Klein was impressive in the bowl game calm plays, but again, he was playing an LSU team that was like, had like 10 guys available. Uh, Kansas State does have five big 12 road games. Iowa State, West Virginia, Oklahoma, TCU, and Baylor. They also get Texas at home, but Texas is coming off of a bye. I mean, I only have them with like two really likely wins, South Dakota and Kansas at home. Uh, you know, they have three true coin flips and then, you know, five semi-coin flips. So Kansas State, tough team to project. I think the win total is about right. Um, and I know you love TCU. They have a quarterback battle of their own, um, but I love their, all their hiring. So I think you're probably going to uh, touch on that. But Sonny Dykes, Garrett Riley, Joe Gillespie, who I love at Tulsa. Uh, what are your thoughts on either one of these teams? I'll let you start with TCU and why you bet them to win the conference. Yeah, I mean, from a TCU perspective, I think this is the most underrated team maybe in Power 5 right now. Uh, that starts, and you've already mentioned them, that starts with the hire of Joseph Gillespie, defensive coordinator. If you're not familiar with what Tulsa did during the pandemic season of 2020 with Zayvon Collins, that was all Joseph Gillespie. And when I went and talked, you know, Sonny Dice gets up on stage at Big 12 Media Days and he says, I have the best defensive coordinator in the nation. And I think some people kind of sat back. I didn't sit back. I said, that's true. I think he does have the best defensive coordinator in the nation. Biggest winners in TARP by far, 90% on both sides of the ball are coming back. 15 players gained and 11,000 snaps via the transfer portal. So all those numbers you saw last year on defense, which were god awful and almost worse than FBS, forget that for TCU. Uh, they are the fourth highest team in players gained from the transfer portal. And with Gary Patterson gone, maybe a new voice in Gillespie is going to get through to the kids and we can just throw all that away because TCU is 127th in tackling. And that is all based on coaching. There's plenty bottom of 10. Do you can argue a bottom 10 defense last year nationally based on yeah. a lot of the underlying stuff. Yeah. Lawn chairs, statues out there. So I, it was pretty bad, but I mean, there's breakout potential all over this roster on both sides of the ball corners Noah Daniels and and and, and Travis Hodges Tomlinson uh you know I think Daniels had one of the highest uh forced in completion rates and Hodges Tomlinson had one of the lowest rate of separation of all big 12 corners last season and so I think defense is going to be fine and I think that's what everybody's overlooking when you read these magazines and everybody else the talking heads forget it throw it last year out the door because Sonny Dykes uh is going to get this team going now tempo is a really big deal uh Brett's right uh, they were 83rd. TCU was 83rd in tempo, and SMU last year, I believe, was 13th. So TCU is going to have some high-scoring games, and that goes into the offense with Chandler Morris and Max Duggan. Now, we don't know who the starter is going to be, but I would say care? it doesn't matter. I don't, yeah, I don't think it matters. I, they're both going to be able to score a ton of points. Quentin Johnson, uh, fifth in the nation, an average depth of target. They have so many weapons for this air raid. Yeah, their wide receiver, their wide receiver room is great. And finally, the offensive line returns 80% of snaps from last season. I could go on and on and on. Let's just say this morning, shoving money across the counter, TCU minus 10. That took some steam from eight, up from eight and a half against Colorado in week one. I love this team to be in the Big 12 championship game, which means buying 14 to 1, 16 to 1, 18 to 1. You got a chance to hedge there. Uh, I'm completely sold on the frogs. Yeah, 113 career starts in the offensive line. And they dealt with a ton of injuries last year. They had five different starting right guards. So get a little better luck in that aspect. And you could see, you know, and the defense obviously has to improve. That's the assumption here. The defense was, what, 122nd rush D, 118th scoring D, 119th overall, just from a statistical standpoint, non-schedule non, uh, adjusted. So, yeah, if the defense with Gillespie, who we both love, improves, and, you know, the, the talent is there, especially on the back end, then like, I got to you have to replace some important pieces up front, um, but you could see a big jump from TCU and their five and seven record last year. Kansas State also around 14 to one. Is this just come down to like Martinez? Like Martinez yeah. giveth and Martinez taketh. Um, any thoughts on Kansas State and, and the Deuce Vaughn show? Well, first off, Coach K is 22 and 13 and one against the spread since he took over Manhattan. So don't try to fade Kansas State game to game it's just it hasn't worked out and I don't think this team is one of the best trenches I mentioned Baylor was best offensive line uh Kansas State's right up there on both sides of the ball 
Uh, but this does, this comes down to Adrian Martinez. Now they were trying to dress it up at big 12 media days, right? I got to talk to Adrian Martinez and Deuce Vaughn. Deuce has fumbled once in over 300 carries in his life. And I said, well, what's the key to that? Because now you guys got Adrian Martinez and Adrian Martinez knows that that's a, a point of emphasis, but he also said, listen, we're going to be running off, you know, we're going to run in the ball a lot between the fullback, between Deuce, we're running a lot of 21 sets. So they're going to try to take some pressure off of them. But at the same time, Adrian Martinez, 30 interceptions and 42 fumbles recorded at Nebraska during his career. Uh, I'm a little nervous about an offensive line that returns just 40% of snaps. Uh, Deuce Vaughn, in my opinion, is the best all-purpose back probably in the nation. Uh, and I think, you know, Colin Klein taking over an offensive coordinator is, is great. Optimus Klein is back you know, in our, in our vernacular, we can talk about him, but uh, you know, the offensive line, I got some worries about some of the experience that we have there. The defensive line though, uh, Felix and Anadike Zoma and Eli Huggins are animals. They're bigger than houses. They're going to be great. But the problem is the back seven cannot defend passes. They cannot tackle. And as much as I love Kansas state, and I'm going to back them week to week, I couldn't take them to win the conference mostly because the defense just has way too much to prove from a tackling perspective. All right, moving on to the next tier with two teams that are around 20 to one, West Virginia and Iowa State. And these two teams I've grouped together for another reason that out of all the power five teams, they might have been hurt the most via the transfer portal. Iowa State, in addition, lost all of those seniors, including Brock Tober, Brock Purdy, a quarterback. You know, you lose a stud running back so much on the defense. I have two restart, returning starters on the defense. We'll have new quarterbacks on both teams. Um, West Virginia will have JT Daniels uh, with play calling now going to offensive coordinator Graham Harrell. I think that'll be good for the offense. Um, but your boy, Neil Brown, under 500 uh, total in three seasons. With Iowa State, uh, it's like, you know, one of the most disappointing seasons last year. They finished seven and six. Their win totals at six and a half. West Virginia sitting at around five and a half. West Virginia does have tough non-conference road trips to Pitt and Vatek. But they do only have four road Big 12 games, as does Iowa State. Um, Iowa State obviously has to go to Iowa, too. But these two teams were just crushed. I, I, Iowa State, just a bizarre year last year. They went one in six in one possession games. They lost on a 62-yard field goal. They didn't convert a two-point conversion against Baylor. Now there's no expectations here. Under the radar, is that a good thing? It's a really young secondary, just a gutted roster. Deckers will take over at quarterback. Hard team to figure out, but is this like the spot where you do buy Iowa State when there's no expectations on them? And uh, similarly, West Virginia with a new quarterback gutted by the transfer portal. A lot of questions on that roster. Um, trenches are a lot more set than the other positions at West Virginia, but there's certainly questions with both of these teams. Any thoughts on either or both? Yeah, I, both I have as unders. I'll start with Iowa State. I project them at 6.2. And, you know, I talked to the big takeaway I had from Matt Campbell when I talked to him at Big 12 Media Days is that your tight end group is flushed, like they're gone. Uh, you have some redshirt freshmen in there that you had a pretty good recruiting class a couple of years ago, and but they just don't have any experience whatsoever. Are you going to veer off of the 13 and the 12 sets? And he said, we're definitely going to run offense that fits the personnel and the experience that we have right now. So what Matt Campbell is used to doing is setting up a bunch of tight ends out there and, and running motion more than anybody. That's it's going to be a complete offensive reset here. And that makes me extremely uncomfortable, especially when you have a win total of six and a half, when all you need is six to make this the longest streak of Iowa state going to a bowl in program history in over 120 years. If they make a bowl this year, that's gotta be the goal. So I'm not really sure what the goal is to win seven games, but uh, I mean, there's a complete rebuild rebuild here on offense. Uh, and speaking of, you know, I said that coach K at Kansas state was highly profitable Matt Campbell was the toast of the head coaching circles, but since 2018, he's under the 500 mark against the spread. So going against, you know, Iowa State's been actually pretty profitable over the years. And now he doesn't have Brock Purdy in October. No, he, and nor, nor does he have Brees Hall. That's like a player that comes through Iowa State, like what, once every 20 or 30 years? So West Virginia, I mean, I project this really low, way under the five and a half. I got him at 3.7. This is somebody I did take an under on. It's good that JT Daniels and Graham Harrell are back together again after working in the 2019 season. Uh, but, you know, they and they have a lot of portal movement here. They have 10 players gained. 
uh, a top 15 rank and number of snaps acquired at 7,300. The whole secondary might be transfers, entire yeah. sec starting secondary. There's a ton of change here, and that's what the Neil Brown era has been, has been all defense. He hasn't been able to generate any kind of offense whatsoever. And now, you know, you're asking JT Daniels to go back to do a Graham Harrell. You would think that, you know, they would adopt a lot of the air raid schemes that you saw it out at USC. Uh, I just think that there's – you know, going to be some real issues here with this offensive line. They do get 73% of their snaps back, but still this is one of the worst teams in the nation last year when it comes to explosive plays. So is JT Daniels doing dink and dunk Slovis style, or is he going deep with the four verts? Uh, we're going to have to find out. The defense has been the bread and butter of that West Virginia team, but now it's just Dante Stills. Uh, and we do trust in DC, you know, Jordan Leslie is one of the best defensive coordinators in the nation. They were 16th in finishing drives, but they've lost so much and filled so much with transfers. It's just too much of a question mark for me. So I, I'll take it under here also. Yeah, lots of questions at linebacker and then, you know, a brand new secondary full of transfers. Hard to project. I saw that you bet West Virginia pit under. Yeah. The total has come down a little bit. I was struggling with that. Pitt is one of my favorite under teams this year. Yeah. I just think that Narduzzi's back to his roots with just <laughs> running the ball with the, his new offensive coordinator. Whipple's gone. So I, I think the pit and the defensive line for Pitt, they have two pros on their defensive line. Defense still should still be good, but I think they're going to be a lot slower. They're going to run the ball even more. And, you know, obviously they lose Addison and uh, Kenny Pickett. Right. They're a tremendous duo. But then West Virginia, the one thing I'm worried about, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this, like I have questions about their secondary and at linebacker, maybe Pitt just runs it and the strength yep. of the defensive team for the defensive, uh, the defense of West Virginia is their defensive line. But I'm also – kind of where does West Virginia do you expect them to go a lot more up tempo and go way more pass heavy or what are your what are your thoughts on the offense and just that if you have any thoughts on that total they're going to go pass heavy but it's going to be more of a Mike Leach pass heavy right uh, Mike Leach and Mississippi State not one of the fastest teams in the nation so I don't expect to see a lot of tempo here I don't, I don't expect to see them within the top 40 of, of seconds per play uh, specifically about that under in the backyard brawl that's going to kick off the season not to mention that it could be like 90 to 100 degrees because that's about what it is everywhere in the nation right now. Uh, that bet was pushed across the counter uh, by a, a runner for me. Uh, the second I got done talking to Pat Narduzzi uh, in the uh, lobby of the Weston. So let's just say Pat Narduzzi is extremely happy with Frank Signetti coming in as offensive coordinator. They are going to probably be the slowest offense in the nation. He wants to run the ball on every single down. Uh, and I just don't expect to see any kind of pace whatsoever. And I have enough trust in the, in the pit defense that can shut down any kind of high tempo or any dump offs that Graham Harrell wants to do with JT Daniels. I think it's a real tough opening game considering what Pitt's defense is. That number was, uh, when I made the bet was 54 and a half. It's down to 52 key number of four. You're going to want to get this bet in before key numbers of 51 and 49. Cause I think the under is just going to keep going. All right, moving on to the final two teams in the conference. We'll start with Texas Tech. They're about 50 to 1 to win the conference, win total five and a half. Um, thing to note here, a lot of changes, right? You're going to have a new head coach, Joey McGuire, new offensive coordinator, Zach Kittley from Western Kentucky, Zappy Nation, um, new defensive coordinator, Tim DeRuiter, new special teams coach. You have a um, quarterback battle in camp. I think it's either going to be Donovan Smith or Tyler Shuck. I, I think Shuck's going to end up winning the job based on what they want to do, but that is yet to be determined. Um, they have some questions at receiver and along the offensive line. And of course the defense with it's Texas tech, how much better is the defense going to be interesting schedule. They have tough non-conference games versus Houston and NC state. They do only have four road big 12 games, but they host Oklahoma, Texas and Baylor. All right, so like three of the top teams in the Big 12. I generally don't like that for a win total over when you get a lot of the tougher opponents at home. Um, so like the seal, the floor isn't that high here, especially you know, the only given win is, you know, you assume Kansas and Murray State at home. And that's it. I mean, a lot of your kind of the middling teams in the Big 12, you're going on the road to play. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you're playing Houston and NC State in the non-con. Uh, thoughts on Texas Tech? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is another under. There's too many moving pieces here. Uh, 9,200 career snaps gained through the transfer portal. That is top 10. So not only do we have a new head coach, new coordinators, we got a lot of new players there. And yes, there is a quarterback battle between Tyler Shug and Donovan Smith. But I would say that that's not really a quarterback battle. It's going to be Tyler Shug. He's going to be what runs it up until the 20-yard line. Why do you say that? Because Joey McGuire told us, 
I would be crazy not to have a six foot five, 240 pound quarterback running power at the goal line. Donovan Smith is going to be the red zone option. Tyler Sugar. They're going to, you know, Zach Kidley's job, you know, he got the best out of Bailey Zappi at uh, Western Kentucky and at Houston Baptist. His job is to unlock what Tyler Shook was able to do in his time in Oregon, making him just a, a dual threat. We'll see if he can pull that off. But, you know, Tim DeReeder comes in as the DC. Anybody that's been listening to our podcast for years knows I am not a fan of him as a defensive coordinator when he was at Oregon, when he was at Cal, there were drops in finishing drives. There was drops in havoc and success rate. Defenses generally got worse the years that he was there. And he plays a very bend, don't break. Like you can have the entire field and then we'll firm up once we get to the 20. So I'm, <laughs> it, it, that's just the way Texas Tech. So we're going to bet a lot of in your we'll bet, a lot of overs uh, during the Texas Tech season. Uh, but this is a defense that finished 122nd, allowing opponents to score past the 40-yard line last year. And now you're bringing in Tim DeRuiter that's going to allow everybody to cross the 40-yard line. So this is an under for me. Uh, I projected at 4.7. But it's going to be fun to watch. I, I think in-game overs, weekly overs is going to be the call here. And I, I would love to see Donovan Smith and more of his magic. He's a great guy to watch uh, weekly. So, uh, But still, team under. Don't expect him to be compete for the Big 12 whatsoever. Yeah, they lose two key linebackers and, you know, their top three tacklers overall on that now four two five defense. And uh, I'm concerned about the offense. Like their offensive line had was basically healthy all year last year. Great injury luck. They lose three key pieces on the offensive line. They're going to be relying on transfers at a lot of places, but they also lose their leading receiver. Um, and as we to the NFL. So there are some questions here. Transfer reliant. They get to host the best teams in the conference, but I actually think that works against them. Um, with OU, Texas, and Baylor. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's uh, under nothing here. All right, our final team's Kansas, 250 to one to win the Big 12. Uh, it's Leopold's second year as the head coach, his coordinators as well. They're much more experienced now, returning 17 starters. Win total over two and a half, minus 145. They had three close games to close the year last year. They won at Texas. Sorry, Texas fans. They lost that TCU in a close one and also against West Virginia. Um, they improved a lot. And guess what? That coincided with Daniels starting at quarterback. He's expected to win that job and be the day one starter over Justin Bean. I think he's out of camp for illness now, but he's just expected to be the backup. They were also the fourth youngest team in the country last year. So they're much more experienced. Um, there's some transfer movement here. Can the defense improve at all? It's one of the worst pass defenses in the country. Uh -huh. They only had 14 sacks all year. Uh, but there's a lot of experience here. Nine, nine offensive starters, eight defensive starters in year two of a head coach and schemes. They have five road Big 12 games. Um, they The last time they won multiple Big 12 games was in 2008. <laughs> they are 28 and 135 since their last bowl appearance in 2008. And um, they ended an 18 game Pac 12, they ended an 18 game Big 12 losing streak and a 56 game road losing streak in Big 12 with a win at Texas last year. Uh, but I think that things are trending up. Win total to over two and a half minus 145. It's taken some money from its opener. They have, if you look, you know, I mean, Texas, I guess you have to say Texas at home is a winnable game based on the history. But the, the obvious winnable games for Kansas, are Tennessee Tech at home to open the year. They have Duke at home as a non-conference game. They also get Iowa State at home. We talked about everything that Iowa State lost. They get Oklahoma State at home after a bye. Um, and then, of course, Texas, who Texas fans are going to be afraid of that game. So there's some winnable games here. I And, and I think that Daniels is going to give them a better shot to win on a weekly basis starting from week one. And you have to be – like with a with a first year head coach, first year coordinator, and then a quarterback change last year, and all of that coming back with a lot of experience, you have to be a bit optimistic for how Kansas closed the year and assume that they're going to take some of that momentum into next year. The defense is a lot of questions on that defense. So, what are your thoughts on Rock Chalk? Well, we're going over. We're going over two and a half. We're going to enjoy this all oh season. Boy. Uh, listen, Lance Leipold, everywhere that he has been, he has made something out of nothing. A year ago, he takes this job after spring practice, right? After spring games. So, I mean, talk about coming in at the wrong time to get this position. And a year ago at this time, like when two days practice, when fall camp started, they didn't know who the quarterback's going to be. 
we have defined roles. We have defined positions. We're in a much better stance from an experience perspective than we were a year ago. Uh, and, second in the nation in penalties too, which is a really good sign for a first year head coach. Like they, they were second, had the second fewest penalty yards. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, that's what he does. And I have to remind everybody that when Lance Leipold was at, at Buffalo in the Mac, he always had, he was outside the top 10 in recruiting in that conference and yet they were always in the MAC championship game or at least contending for it in that division. So he knows how to get, no matter what quality player, what star he gets, he's able to make something out of nothing. And I think what everybody needs to point to is, is that on defense, you mentioned no pass rush whatsoever. I would say the biggest move in the 14 portal, sacks all year, 14. That was it. the biggest, the biggest move in the transfer portal that went unnoticed was edge Lonnie Phillips, Lonnie Phillips coming Miami. from Miami of Ohio number one in the nation per PFF in pressure rate, 21% pressure rate. Anytime the ball is snapped, one out of every five times, he's getting pressure on the quarterback. That is monster. Uh, that's going to be big for this. And, and you know, Jalen Daniels over on the offensive side, uh, you know, there's not a huge sample set of him throwing, but it, the highlights for him came on the ground, lined up in shotgun, pistol, running the RPO. Daniels has the plenty of ability to do things outside the tackle box. The Jayhawks are going to be monster favorites over Tennessee Tech. They're going to be five and a half point favorites at Duke on September 24th. So then after that, you just got to find a win on the schedule. West Virginia, Texas Tech, Iowa State. These teams are going through a complete rebuild of roster construction. There's coordinators getting mixed in there. And, you know, they're, they all, all those teams are leaning heavy on the portal. You include Houston. I mean, they're going to be an underdog in all these spots, but there's a lot of games where they can get that third win. And so I'm a, I am a believer in what's going on up there. I think they got the right coach for somebody the the kind of talent they bring in through the, through the uh, recruiting every year. I, I think that they're going to be able to win three games here. I, I mean, I project them at 2.4 and we're just going to have a leap of faith. I mean, no one would have guessed the Jayhawks to beat Texas last year and they did. Uh, I think the program's on the upturn. I think three would be a great season. All right. Fuck it. I'll join you. Um, Rock chalk team Daniels. Um, yeah, that game, that game at Duke, that game against Duke is at home. That's actually in Lawrence. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, they they, you know, even I mean at West Virginia, it's probably a lost game too, and at Houston's probably lost. But Tennessee Tech and Duke at home, good chance that they start two and two to start the year and build on that momentum from last year. All right, good stuff with the Big Twelve. Shout to Brett McMurphy for joining us as well. Come before we get out of here, just uh, highlight if you want to just run through a couple, you can. But highlight uh, if you want to list them. But highlight your favorite. Future win total. I'll start with mine. Just Oklahoma State under eight and a half. I think the loss of Jim Knowles, the losses that they suffered at linebacker and in the secondary. Combine that with some on the offensive side, lose your leading rusher, your leading receiver. I have some questions about the offensive line. If anything happens to Standers, who will probably give away a game or two uh, for a team that has a lot of regression coming from them, if they're benefiting from just great turnover luck, close game luck, inadvertent whistle luck. Uh, I don't think that Oklahoma State gets to nine wins this year. Uh, so I'm going under eight and a half on Oklahoma State. And I also took a shot on Texas to win the Big 12 three to one or better. Uh, Colin, you favorite future that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, from a winning the conference perspective, I'll do TCU. I take it all the way down to 14 to one out there. Uh, it's not being talked enough about Joseph Gillespie taking over as defensive coordinator, how they've utilized the portal to kind of wash away the numbers they had. Don't base things on TCU after what happened last season. It's a brand new era with Sonny Dykes, uh, and he's going to get it going from a win total perspective. I like the Baylor under. What I didn't mention before, they went four and one in games that were decided within one possession last year. There is definitely a second order win total negative effect that went against their power rating this offseason. Uh, they are completely empty on their skill positions uh, from a wide receiver and from a running back perspective. Yes, they have great trenches, but they're using the portal heavily to learn a Dave Aranda defensive system that it runs just a half dozen different personnel groups. Uh, this is a really tough schedule that, you know, second order win total that, that karma luck that they've had in one possession games, that's going to come back and get them. Uh, and this is a team that's going to go under their win total uh, of seven and a half, eight, if you can get it, but I project them a little bit above six. Yeah. Baylor also lost secondary two two in the secondary to the NFL as well as their nickel back. Um, and they have no returning receivers with double digit catches. So, yeah, the offensive line, look, they have four starters who have to return for a fifth year. Should be great, but um, and we're also not fans of shape, and so I would agree with you there.